I live in Jackson, Mississippi. I have been teaching for 16 years, and I've only been an atheist for about six. Secular humanist, whatever you want to call me. I don't really care for the word atheist that much. Um, I mean, I, I embrace it because it is me. I am, I am without belief in gods, but um, at the same time, that just tells you what I don't believe. Right? And that's why we call ourselves humanists, most of us, because that actually speaks to positive beliefs. Right? And, um, and that's something where we can actually find common ground with other people. And that's one of the things I want to talk about some while I'm talking about public education. Because the fact of the matter is, if you saw, uh, who had the slide up a minute ago? Was it you, Carolyn, that, had the, that showed like something like 75% of people from both parties, major parties, uh, had the same essential values that they wanted communicated um, about sex ed. Right? Um, and that's an important factor that I think a lot of people skip over. And I'm kind of jumping ahead of something I want to get to later on in the talk. And that is that when you are outnumbered, as I am in Mississippi, you learn how to not burn your bridges. You learn how to build bridges and to make allies. And I think that we are outnumbered nationally more than we realize, at least whenever we embrace certain labels. Um, and I'm going I'm to talk about that in a little bit. I have a disagreement with a number of people about how exactly you parse out uh, demographically what people believe and don't believe in the United States. And the fact of the matter is that it is in the single digits when you ask people, are you an atheist or an agnostic? Now, we can bicker and argue about what their actual theistic beliefs are and whether we think they're legitimate and is that even a real God that you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as embracing the label itself is concerned, uh, we greatly reduce our numbers when we use that label as our primary label, too many people see that as something that's other than what they are. And when you are outnumbered, you, 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 don't do, you don't shoot for the smallest target, you shoot for the bigger ones, and you look for your allies. So again, that's getting ahead of myself. I wanna tell you a little bit about my story, because I'm not gonna assume that y'all all know that much about me. Um, my girls and I, uh, we, we have a very good relationship, despite the fact that I'm an atheist and they're not. They are all good Baptist girls at this point, just like I raised them to be. Uh, and their mother is also raising them to be that as well. In fact, as we speak, I think they're attending the big Christmas pageant that they have at our church every year. And that church draws something like twenty to 30,000 people every year for that event. Uh, my sister is the president of the choir, and she usually sings the solo. You know, she plays Mary, and she puts on the... It's Broadway-quality production, you know, uh, and, and usually televised over Christmas time. It's a big production. Church I grew up in is a mega church. It's a Southern Baptist church. It occupies two city blocks. The building is five stories tall. And that's the world that I came from. And the world that I came from is not the hardcore, angry fundamentalist. The, the kind that I came from has what I call a closet, an inner fundy. Right? They only let it out at certain times when they feel threatened by certain things. They put a, a much prettier package on their fundamentalism. And they usually go by the term evangelical. But there's really not much difference between an evangelical and a fundamentalist. It's, it's semantics and it has to do with stylistic differences. You know, a fundamentalist wears their beliefs on their sleeves and uh, an evangelical kind of keeps it under his hat or, and plays it close to the chest, so to speak. They really believe the same things. And if you try to challenge them on certain issues, what you'll find is they really have essentially the same beliefs. And it kind of comes down to what do you think about the Bible? You know, that's one of their most important uh, disagreements. Um, and when we get into these charter schools, a lot of them are going to see a lot of that happening where it's, it's got these, these closet fundamentalist beliefs that they don't tell you about up front, which I find is dishonest, personally. And one of the problems that we face as secularists is that we have to learn how to fight fire with fire. And when they assume political roles and they grab them on purpose in order to influence the public sphere, we, we have to do the same thing or else we give up. But we don't want to use the same tactics they do. Typically, secularists try to be more open and honest. We're the people who couldn't lie about Santa Claus or whatever our thing was. We were, we were too honest. Now, it doesn't mean we can't be dishonest because I've seen a lot of dishonesty among secularists, but we have our first natural inclination is to just speak frankly. And that doesn't work well in politics. Well, actually it does now, doesn't it? I have, I have not had as difficult a time before as I did this time in thinking about what I wanted to talk about. Because as a public educator, first of all, I have too many things to say. Not, not, not enough. But the other problem is that a lot of political topics relate to what I'm talking about because politics and education are very intimately tied together. And for me, it's very personal because my girls are being brought up in a very conservative, evangelical upbringing. And in Mississippi, the public schools and the private schools are not any different as far as how religious they are. The private schools are actually sometimes more secular 
Um, it's kind of hard to explain how that happens, but in the public schools, it's, it's this funny conundrum. It's, it's irony. They, they think that they've got this mission field in front of them, the teachers and the administrators, and they show up at school every day waiting to share Jesus with the children because they see it as this mission field that's ripe for the harvest. They're all already Christians. Like 95% of the children are. So this, this mentality that they've got, that they're on a mission field, is so fabricated. It's manufactured, but it makes them feel like they have purpose in their life, like they're saving children's souls. Meanwhile, at the private schools, they, they, many of them in Mississippi don't even have that pressure because they were started by Episcopalians years ago. And Episcopalians don't really care what you believe. I deconverted at 35. It took me longer than most people to figure out that it was, you know, all baloney. The stuff that I was taught... Um, I learned it so well that I was better than most people at rationalizing what I believed. And that's one of the things you have to understand is that if you've never been religious, you, you don't need to assume that people who are religious are less intelligent than you. Because really what intelligence does is it just equips you. It enables you to justify what you already believe. It's not always that good at, at helping you break through your beliefs that you were given at your youngest years. And so many times you end up with highly intelligent people who just have these compartments that they never really allow that bright light of their rationalism to shine into. And they use their intelligence instead to construct rationalizations for why the fact that what they believe doesn't appear to be logical doesn't matter. For example, I used to believe that the reason why things that seemed contradictory are contradictory is because God's ways are higher than our ways. There's like these two realities and I had this dualistic mindset so that things on a spiritual level don't have to make sense. right? So. And, and you grow up in that kind of mentality, you eventually learn to accept incoherence. It, you, you learn to accept uh, contradictions because you believe that that's just the way God is. He works in mysterious ways, right? So when you try to teach them critical thinking skills, you run into this problem. So I got to the point in my 30s where I realized I didn't believe the things that I used to believe anymore. And at first I kept it to myself because in Mississippi you don't talk about it. You just don't. It, it can lead to consequences. When the time came that I did start to talk about it, I began losing friends just falling like flies. Uh, I pretty much lost every friend I had before because most of my friends, most of my closest relationships were ministers. And in fact, several of them took it upon themselves to try to reconvert me. When I went to them and told them that I wasn't a Christian anymore, they staged an intervention. And five of them, they spent 12 hours one day just grilling me about everything. They wanted to know, what are your, what are your porn watching habits? How often do you masturbate? They actually asked me this, you know, and I wanted to say, well, how often do you, no, no, I don't even want to know, please. <laughs> They wanted to know where did, where did uh, you know, if, how do we come from monkeys and where did life come from? And if I couldn't answer these questions, you know, to get into the Christian faith, all you have to do is say, I believe in Jesus. To get out of it, you have to have had a PhD in biochemistry, in physics, in geology, and you have to have an explanation for everything or you're not allowed to leave. You know, the double standard is insane. I knew that was coming, so I kept it to myself. And when I finally did come out about it, it did lead to a lot of, a lot of friends falling away. Eventually, my marriage didn't survive either. There were multiple reasons, but when we went to a counselor, we of course had to go to a Christian counselor because that's all we have where I live. Everyone's a Christian counselor. Our guy had a degree from seminary. That was his, his PhD was in therapy, but it was from a seminary. So of course the solution to everything for me was to come back to Jesus. And that didn't work. And eventually we weren't able to find common ground to work through the other issues that we had. So we ended up having to go our separate ways and we share our daughters, uh, but obviously she has the greater weight of, of the support of her community around her. I am the only atheist that my girls know. So I know what it's like to live completely outnumbered and I think that the mentality that I have would probably work for more people than they realize because I think we've misunderstood how outnumbered we are. How many people are out there that really believe this stuff that we didn't think people believed. It turns out they do and they can be duped very very easily. Um, so what I uh, after I went to my divorce, uh, I ended up going to the school where they go to school to teach. And within a matter of two weeks, I was having run-ins with my principal. And evolution was actually the first thing that got me in trouble. Um, we were supposed to teach, uh, I was teaching history, and we were supposed to talk about the early human civilizations. And the curriculum called for us talking about 10,000-year-old human civilizations. And the hands started going up. And the students were like, but Mr. Carter, um, it, the Earth's only about 6,000 years old. And I was like, okay, um, why do you say that? And they're like, because it's in the Bible. And I said, um, the Bible doesn't say the earth is 6,000 years old. I mean, like, I know that, you, I know that you, you believe that, but like, it doesn't actually say that anywhere. So he said, no, it does, and I'll show you tomorrow. So he goes home, and he comes back, and he writes out the genealogy of every human being who's lived, you know, from Adam to Jesus, 
He got it from the Bible. And he and his dad sat down and they went through and they assigned years at which they believed each person probably had the child and counted the years down. And strangely, everybody was about 100 when they had their first child. And uh, I asked him some more questions. Come to find out, his dad was one of the principals at one of the other schools in my school system. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you see where this is going. Um, so I didn't touch that again. I moved on, and that was just the first couple of weeks anyway. I started getting called to the principal's office. I got called in three different times because there was at least one mother that was threatening to sue the school because she said I had failed to separate church and state. And I was like, <laughs> wait, how do, you, how do you figure that? And she said, well, you know, she believes that evolution is a religious belief. You know, it's something that atheists believe. And so you're failing to separate church and state by teaching biology, right, or teaching history. Of course, it was in our state curriculum, but it doesn't matter what it says on paper. What people actually talk about is very different. And I've taught in a lot of public schools in the South, and generally speaking, the biology teachers don't teach evolution. They avoid it. And I've asked them, I said, do you talk about this in class? And they said, no, we try to avoid it as much as possible. And I'm thinking, but it's, it's biology. I mean, in biology, how do you get around evolution? They find ways to do it. Some of it's because they themselves don't believe in it. They see it as a belief system they don't, they don't accept. And the other part is that the uh, people that they teach are going to go home and tell their parents what Mr. So-and-so said. And then there's going to be those calls, and they're going to threaten to sue. And, you know, it just makes a mess where I live. So at any rate, I started getting into hot water with the school system, first because of that, then because of the election. So we had the 2012 election four years ago. My students, I'm proud to say, um, predicted 50 out of 50 states correctly for that election. Like, we nailed the Electoral College perfectly. But it actually wasn't as hard as it sounds. At the time, it was very easy to predict what direction different states were going. It was nothing like this last election. People who are paid professionally to study these things were totally shocked. You've probably seen the county by county maps before, and you know that numerically, it's somewhat misleading to see that many counties because you know that these are population centers where the blue marks are. But at the same time, look at how much land that covers. A large chunk of the United States is very, very conservative, not just politically, but also religiously. Um, I tend to say, because I've been around enough now, that uh, anytime you're 20 minutes outside of a major city in the U.S., you're back in the Bible Belt. I used to think it was just in the South, but it's everywhere. You know, a friend just uh, a couple days ago posted a picture of uh, Oregon, and it was split in half, and there was the, right, the, the, the left half, and the right half was called Northwest Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, because... I had friends from that area, and they're the same way. They said, you know what, where we live, there's religious billboards everywhere. People are trying to put Bibles into the schools. You know, I had a guy hand me a Bible as I went into work uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And Gideon's people, you know, they're there. And you have to actually fight that. And every time you fight it, it causes a stir. In a place like Mississippi, that can get you in really, really hot water fast. So at any rate, I was not out as an atheist at all. I just simply was covering the election, but I wasn't covering it in what they felt was a fair way because I was showing them the Electoral College and how it worked, and at the time, that was favoring Barack Obama. They were going home and telling their parents, Mr. Carter says Barack Obama's going to win. But they were watching Fox News, which was saying that Mitt Romney was going to win. And they got upset, and they started calling the school. Well, the morning after Romney lost, my principal came into my room before school started, and she told me, flat out, you may not discuss the election in your class today. And I was like, but, but I teach history. She said, I don't want you discussing it, and if a kid asks a question, you change the subject. Tell them we're not going to talk about it. And I said, well, how am I going to avoid that? We've been, we've been covering this for weeks. And she said, from this point forward, I don't want you talking about politics or religion in your class. And I said, but why? And she said, because there's talk in the community that you told your students you're an atheist. Well, that's not true, first of all, I didn't. And of course, second of all, it's illegal for her to say that to me, right? To begin restricting what I can teach and not teach. And of course, just to, 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 to cut the long story short, I did appeal to different organizations for help. But the routes that I could use in Mississippi were totally unhelpful because everybody in Mississippi is conservative. I mean, like, I know the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice. I used to teach Sunday school with them. These are all very, very religious people, you know? Uh, all the way up to the top, the way you get elected in Mississippi is by wearing your beliefs on your sleeve, and that works very well, very well there. So I tried all the channels to, to get things taken care of, and even the ACLU in Mississippi is run by a pretty religious person. I mean, she's a devout Christian, and, and that's, that's just the way it is where I am, you know. If you want to convince people in Mississippi uh, to vote for liberal uh, agenda, you have to use Jesus to convince them that it's what Jesus would want. And that's what you have to do in order to, to get them on your side about anything. 
Um, so it's a complicated political situation where I am. She told me I couldn't talk about these things anymore. Within about two months, she moved me out of my history class and put me in a math class. And for the remainder of the school year, I taught math. Because what am I going to say in math, right? <laughs> and uh, I quickly had to teach myself a lot of math because I, <laughs> I was terrible at math. And I actually still kind of am. Just don't tell my students. Because um, I know more than they do, so it works. Well, now I'm 11th graders. But, but you know, um, what happened was at the end of the school year, the, the school brought me back and they said, we're, we're not going to bring you back next year. And I asked them, why not? Because non-renewing is a big deal in, in teaching circles. And uh, they said, well, you know, this is your first year to teach for our school, so we don't have to give you a reason. And I was like, well, can you give me something I can work on for the future? And the best they could come up with was, well, we need you to be a better team player, whatever that means. That's one of those catch-all kinds of phrases. Um, but I knew exactly what the problem was. The principal had brought it out from the very beginning, and I know where it came from. It's because one of my students, two weeks before that conversation with the principal, one of my students raised her hand in class, and she had been stalking me on Facebook, and she said she saw I liked an atheist page. It's a damn Facebook. It's always Facebook, you know? <laughs> Get me in trouble every time. And so she raised her hand. She said, Mr. Carter, are you an atheist? And I dodged the question. I said, well, I'm not going to be talking about my religious beliefs in class because as a teacher I'm not supposed to get into that and they said why didn't you say no so that's when the talk began I even had one of the students in my class corner my oldest daughter on the bus one day and say what religion are you and she's like we're we're Baptists <laughs> and she's like what religion's your dad Baptist you know she didn't know because I hadn't talked with them about this yet again where I am I'm the only atheist in their family so long story short I ended up having to find another job at another school and I found an inner city school that was happy to have a teacher without asking too many questions. <laughs> and everything was great the first year. Students loved me, we got along great. But about that time I started writing a blog. Because I'm like, you know what, at this point I can pretty much just go on and talk about these things because now I've already lost a job. Uh, I'd already lost my family essentially and I lost all my friends. What's there left to lose, right? Uh, the most dangerous person is the one who has nothing left to lose. Now there's nothing left to fear. So I started writing and I thought maybe a handful of people would start reading it, but I didn't realize how many people outside of Mississippi had the same problems that I had. You know? And um, before long, my students at the new school found the blog and they started carving things in the walls and on the desks like Jesus and Bible verses. I called it evangelism. You know? <laughs> and I would, <laughs> I would go away to a conference and would be speaking and when I came back, they had torn my room to shreds. And, and it was because they, just, they learned to disrespect me. You know? They didn't see me as a, as a good person anymore. Once they saw that I was, heard that I was an atheist, that flipped a switch for them. And I've had so many people do that to me. Uh, people think I'm a great guy until they find I'm an atheist, and all of a sudden their opinion just plummets immediately because they think you can't be a good person if you're an atheist. So imagine being a teacher in that situation. And I tried going through our unions, by the way, and, and Mississippi's a right-to-work state. So unions don't have any authority or power where I am. So this is everything I'm very passionate about as a, as a teacher, is how do you actually try to instill secular values or even pluralism in a place where they don't think pluralism is the way the country is supposed to look. They actually have got an alternative vision of what this country was supposed to be founded upon. They really do believe it's a Christian nation. They seriously believe that. And the thing is, if you look at the right places, you can find people who taught that early on. Because America was always diverse. And within that diversity, that included some very religious people who wanted the United States to be a religious place. Right? Let me go back to, to this preview. Can I talk about the election for just a minute? Do you know who this person is talking to Steve Bannon? He probably is the most important person in this election, and you don't know that. Jared Kushner, that is his son-in-law. He's married to Ivanka. All right? He probably won this election for Donald Trump. He is a numbers guy. And um, I want you to go Google at some point Forbes magazine's article about Kushner. And basically what they said was he used essentially a money ball approach to this presidential election. And have you ever seen Moneyball, or do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, Aaron Sorkin is always awesome, so you should always see every Aaron Sorkin movie, and that was an Aaron Sorkin movie. Moneyball had Brad Pitt, and he, it played a guy who went to work for a, a Major League Baseball team. And instead of using the usual romanticized, traditional approach to baseball, where you hire the stars, you know, you, you line up, your, your lineup needs to include stars that will bring people in and get everybody excited about the game, and then the enthusiasm will bring them to the championship. He had a totally nerdy, non-sexy approach. He just looked at the numbers and figured out how to crunch the numbers in such a way that they could statistically maximize the spread of the skill on the baseball team. And everybody said, this is the stupidest way to run baseball. You can't do baseball this way. And they ended up winning the whole season. 
and it changed the way everybody did baseball from that point on. Now, again, it's not sexy. It got rid of the romance of the sport in a lot of ways, but it worked. And that's what ended up happening with this election was of all the things that Donald Trump did in the process of campaigning, he turned to his son-in-law to try to run the social media aspect of the election. And what Kushner did was, Kushner, I never say his name right, is he started out with merchandising. He took the, those damn hats and different kinds of buttons and things and was selling them online. And what he did was he tracked the way people purchased the merchandising. He found out where the population densities were that purchased these things. Then he went to the, um, you gotta read this article, it goes into detail. Um, he went to the uh, major media organizations and found out that there was a, a strong correlation between certain kinds of political views and the TV shows they would watch on Netflix or HBO. So like they found that the Walking Dead viewership had a high correlation with anti-immigration feelings, which is an interesting thing, isn't it? No, I'm serious. That was, you know, the people who run these businesses, they do a lot of very high paid research into their viewership to see what they like and what they don't and who to market to. And Kushner took a, an intelligent approach to this and said, why don't we use the data that's out there and crunch it in such a way that we can access that in order to create a smarter campaign. Never mind about the rallies themselves. Everybody assumed you're supposed to go to this city, then this city, then this city, because look at the Electoral College, this is where you're supposed to be. But everybody was watching him going, where's Trump going? Why is he there this weekend? That doesn't make any sense. It's because Kushner was saying, this is where you need to go this weekend. I'm looking at our numbers and this is where you're going to get the biggest rally. So go here and then go here. And he just started doing whatever his son-in-law said. And he kept working those numbers through social media, through crunching the data. And he ended up turning the election over to his father-in-law. And the more people are analyzing this, the more they're saying this is the way political campaigns need to be run in the future if they're going to be successful in the post-2016 election landscape. The old approach to how campaigning work cannot work the same way as it used to. Now, I'm just old enough to not understand that very well, seriously. My understanding is I know how to go up to people and talk to them and have conversations. And, and, and as the government still works, at the government level, phone calls still work and emails still work and showing up at Capitol Hill still works. And that's, that's something I want to see everybody trained to do in Mississippi and in the South. I would love for you all to come there and show us how to do that, by the way, please. Figure out a way to like take a road trip and teach us. But at any rate, um, but in the, in the broader scheme of the national electorate, there was a different approach that was needed. And I think that we could learn from that. I don't know how to do it. Somebody smarter than me that knows how to do this needs to go in there and figure out how did they use social media that smartly. Smartly? Is that a word? Bigly's a word now, so smartly should be a word. Right. Have you ever heard of the Bible riots of Philadelphia? Shifting gears for just a second. It has not always been a universal belief that America should be a pluralistic nation. And, you know, from the very beginning, uh, the, the founders of our country leaned toward the pluralistic direction, but not everybody was a pluralist. And I'll get to an example of someone who wasn't in just a minute. But as late as 1844, we still had, this is called the Philadelphia Bible Riots. Um, the reason why this riot happened, I think 32 people were killed. Uh, something like two dozen houses were burned, four churches were burned. Eventually they had to call in what was at the time like the National Guard. Uh, but it was the state militia, in order to quell these, these, uh, these riots that were happening every night for three or four nights in the summer of 1844. What happened was the, uh, the public schools read from the Bible every morning before class, just like they did when I was a kid, by the way. But they got into a fight over which version of the Bible they would read from in the mornings. And basic, well, what happened was 1844 was one year before the potato famine. Of, of Ireland and over the next 10 years the Irish immigration was massive. Uh, I think I read that in 1841 there were 8 million people in Ireland. Uh, 10 years later there were 6 million. They, they dropped by 25 percent over 10 years. One million died because of the potato famine and another million left and came to the United States and they hit cities like New York and Philadelphia and if you ever heard of the Know Nothing Party that happened after that, that was something like a precursor to what happened with Donald Trump. It was a, an anti-immigration sentiment, which is incidentally something that's happening around the world if you didn't notice. It's not just Brexit, it's not just America. There is a, an international push to limit immigration because anytime there's turmoil and increased mobility in different parts of the world, 
obviously everybody starts to deal with immigration problems. And there's always a pushback. And anytime you see a major movement in one direction, kind of like with a wave, you know how when a wave crashes in, then there's an undercurrent that happens after that? So people got complacent during our last election thinking it seems like we're all going in this direction because just look at how everything's been going. But then all of a sudden there's like this pull under their feet and they couldn't figure out where it's coming from because it's under the surface. Historically, those things always happen. Whenever there's a major change politically or socially, there's a pushback. And that's what happened with this election and that's what so many people didn't see coming. They were looking at the way things have been for the last 10 years or 20 years and they thought that it was going to keep going that way, but that's not how it works. There's a pushback. So many changes to how you define what it means to be an American. Even how you define what it means to be a male or a female. You name anything about us socially and it's being changed and people don't like that. And there's a predictable pushback. So that was happening in Philadelphia and all these Irish immigrants came in and they wanted to read from a Catholic Bible in the morning. And of course that had books, that had books in there that weren't even supposed to be in the Bible, right? The Protestants were getting ticked off, and then one of, the, uh, one of the Catholic bishops, or whatever they called them, came in and requested from the superintendent that they, um, that they allow for schools to choose which version they're going to read from. And that got miscommunicated, and the Protestants thought that he was saying, we're not going to read from any Bibles at all. Because the, the uh, superintendent was like, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this if we're going to be fighting over it. You know, he was trying to help, but they heard, wait, we're not going to be reading from the Bible? Riot. They started burning down houses and churches. Uh, after they burned a couple of churches, they decided it'd be more effective if they would just burn the fire department. <laughs> so they lit the fire department on May 8th and burned it down, which obviously that's what ended up bringing in the National Guard because that was a big problem. Uh, this, was, this was in 1844 in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, 60 years after the founding of our country, and we are still dealing with this. My point is that we have always had a contingent within our country and it is a large contingent that doesn't agree with this concept of pluralism. It doesn't believe that we're not a Christian nation. And the question is, how do we deal with those people? How do we deal with them? And I have more questions than I have answers, honestly, especially this year. It's hard not to feel despondent, especially living where I live and losing as many things as I lose. But I do know a couple of things. I know that when Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick, that's the art of diplomacy, they say. But there's two things happening in that concept. One is, Diplomacy does involve seeking to have conversations to build positive, uh, positive relationships with people that can be your allies. But on the other hand, they also have to have some element of knowing that if they cross you, you're going to fight. And you're going to fight in the same ways that they understand. In courthouses, you're going to fight in the school board's meetings, right? You're going to fight through talking to your legislators. These are the things that they can happen at the same time. You don't have to be a jerk and be an activist. You can actually be a polite, kind, empathetic, understanding person who knows how to have conversations with religious people without calling them stupid, but also support people suing whenever they infringe on your rights as a secularist. And both have to be happening. And it feels contradictory, right? Because it, it makes them mad when you go to court. When, uh, when my school that, I, uh, well, that my, my daughters go to right now, uh, they've been sued by the American Humanist Association, I think, three times. And I had nothing to do with that, by the way. I swear, I didn't. Um, they brought in a, a student group from the local church. There was a mega church right down the road. And it's one of those multi-campus churches that are so slick and clean. And the, the, the pastor gets up and everybody just loves listening to him. And they pipe his messages out all over town. You know, it's like five or six campuses, 20,000 members or something spread all over town. And they got their youth group to come to the school and have a mandatory meeting for seniors a mandatory assembly during the middle of school and they all got up and started giving their testimonies about finding Jesus and how they finally had hope in life and and we're like you know there was a girl sitting in the back who is a Christian but a liberal Christian and her friend sitting next to her was an agnostic and she got mad on behalf of her friend for having to sit through being preached at because she said this isn't right so this girl uh, Gracie is what I'll call her she took out her phone and she videoed the, the evangelistic ser service right and she sent it to the American Humanist Association. She's now very good friends with the AHA. Uh, in fact, now she's studying law in Washington, D.C. because she became a lightning rod for controversy as a liberal Christian because she was sticking up for her, her agnostic friend. And uh, first thing they did was they, they sent a letter to the school. You know, they're being very polite. You, you can't do this. You know, you're not supposed to have a mandatory meeting during campus hours that's an evangelistic sermon. And the school did it again the next week for juniors. And they did it again the next week for sophomores. And by the time they got to the next week for the freshmen, 
the AHA had sent so many letters and they said, now we're going to have to sue because we've told you multiple times and we're going to represent the student that says that her rights were infringed upon. So they did sue, but in the end, they didn't make them pay any penalties. They said, look, we're, we're not trying to get money out of you. We want you to s just to treat everyone with the same amount of respect. There are people there that are not Christians. We are Muslim students at your school. There are Hindu students at your school. There are non-theists at your school and you can't treat them like they're all supposed to be Christians. That's sectarian. So eventually they said the deal is from now on, if you continue to do this, you're going to get a $10,000 fine each time. So it only took three months before they ended up getting a $10,000 fine because they got a Methodist minister to come to one of their awards banquets and he started preaching at them again, right, in the middle of his prayer. So $10,000. It hasn't happened again. It stopped. Let me tell you what happened the next year. <clears throat> and there's two sides to this. The next year, uh, the band director decided that they were going to play How Great Thou Art as their big number during the first game of the season. Do you all know that hymn, How Great Thou Art? It's one of the most popular Christian hymns ever, How Great Thou Art. Um, and they were going to play that as a part of their, you know, their, that was their feature piece. And when somebody questioned them about that at the school board meeting, they said, well, isn't that a religious hymn? Because it's like one of the most popular two or three in, in the world. And they said, no, it's, it's from an old Swedish folk tune. You know, we just, we just have a love of Swedish art and we want to, you know, showcase that in our band. But then somebody else pointed out the fact that at one point the band gets into a cross formation and they, and they end this, the, the performance on one knee, you know, but of course that had nothing to do with religion. So the school board, the school board decided to wait until the day before the first game to tell them they couldn't play that, that number. Now, whether the band director knew that was going to happen or not, I don't know. I don't know if there was some collusion going on there. But they waited till the day before to tell them that. And the community was outraged because the band had not prepared a backup. So they said, well, I guess the band's not going to be able to perform. Because we're worried that this atheist group is going to sue us for playing this beautiful Swedish folk tune <laughs> because they think it's religious. Well, to this day, this is two years later, People still take shoe polish and paint How Great Thou Art on the back of their cars in my town. And they drive all over town with How Great Thou Art. There are now bumper stickers, there are decals, there are shirts, scarves, hats that say How Great Thou Art that sell out in my town because they took this as a charge. You know, Finally they could do something that makes them feel like they're standing up for God's kingdom in the world. And everybody there is a Christian, you know, that's so brave. Uh, but <laughs> anyway. So two things are happening. One is the fight was won as far as I'm concerned, at least on paper. The school learned they can't do this without some sort of consequence afterwards. But they never had a change of heart about this. And so what they did was they figured out a way to get the community on their side by making an issue out of it. And people are brilliant about these things. You know, they know how to, how to orchestrate these things so it gets the most press for them. And the community was very much on their side. And the next year when they had the next school board election, uh, the, the, the guy they brought in was the most religious man that they've had yet, and, and it, he's a total theocrat, but I'm not going to get off on that. Um, point is, there is always a pushback. Every time we step out and we say, no, you can't do that, they're going to fight us. I think that fight has to happen. Uh, but I'm also a diplomat, and I think both things need to happen at the same time. We need to work on figuring out how to find our allies. Okay, So I'm going to go back a couple of steps to an example. During the early days of our country's founding, you had a couple of competing visions. You had Patrick Henry, who is famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death. Well, he's also famous for not having the same view of the separation of church and state that some of the other founding fathers had. Patrick Henry had the idea, as a good Anglican and also a Calvinist, that uh, the church should get some sort of portion of the state's income through taxes. He, he had the idea that when you paid your taxes, it should go to the tithes of whatever the approved state church was for your state. That was one of his ideas and Jefferson was like, hell no. <laughs> In fact, I think, I think Henry was the one, and I don't remember the exact quote, but uh, I want to say that Jefferson was writing to maybe Adams, and we got a letter where uh, they said, I think, I think what we must do is pray for his death. <laughs> <laughs> He said that to John Adams, and um, they really didn't like Patrick Henry. He's very much a, a pebble in their shoe. But he had a different view of separation of church and state. And, you know, the homeschooling association that's been built up over the last few decades, uh, they decided they needed their own college so that you could go all the way from birth through college without ever having to touch secularism. And so they created a college for homeschoolers, and they called it Patrick Henry University. 
you know, and it is the leading university for homeschoolers at this point. Um, and incidentally, oh, God, do I even want to get it? Yeah, I'm going I'm to talk about DeVos for just a second. Um, so she belongs to the homeschool movement as well. Of course, the charter movement and the homeschool movement. Uh, she was responsible for getting a lot of, of executive pushes through in Michigan to try to get even homeschooling paid for by the state uh, so that you could just choose your Bob Jones University textbooks and teach it in your own house, and then the government would pay for the texts and everything. Uh, she's been the leading uh, candidate for that for a while. So Patrick Henry wasn't, uh, wasn't the only person that was pushing for that, but there were, there were other states that were fighting this. Massachusetts, for example, they wanted, let's see, um, that would have been Calvinists as well. The northern states were generally Calvinists. The middle uh, southern states, like Virginia, they were more Anglican. And then you had Pennsylvania that had its own way of looking at things because it was founded by Quakers. And the Quakers didn't like the idea of a state-established church. Then you had Rhode Island that was established by Baptists. And Baptists, ironically, were the ones who were the greatest champions of the separation of church and state because at the time they were the underdogs. But it's amazing what changes when you get to be in charge. You know, you no longer are into pluralism once your group's in charge. But this guy, Isaac Backus, became famous for saying a lot of, a lot of things about church and state. And he was a Baptist living in Massachusetts, which made him an outlier in his state. And he said, who can hear Christ declare that his kingdom is not of this world and yet believe that the blending of church and state together can be pleasing to him? This meant a lot to have someone speak the language of Christianity and point out that it's not inconsistent with their beliefs to use pluralism as a basis for how we govern ourselves. And my suggestion is that in the process of our fighting things in the courts and in the state houses and in the school board meetings, we also need to be learning to listen for these people, these allies that we have that say, we have the same aims you do. We're not atheists. But we also don't think we need to be shoving our religion on people because if his kingdom is not of this world, then we don't want to be putting all of our people in positions of great political power because that's actually just going to corrupt the church. The separation of church and state is beneficial to both. But we have to get that message across to them in a way that makes them care about it. They have to be afraid of us, yes, but they also have to learn to own this themselves somehow. And, and it feels completely contradictory, but both have to happen. It's that speak softly and carry a big stick philosophy. We need to find a way to hit both fronts, to look for our natural allies, the ones who will say, yeah, we think comprehensive sex ed, it turns out, actually does better in preventing unwanted teen pregnancies and STDs. So that's the way we need to go. There are Catholic churches even that are pushing for this, which is amazing to me. We need to find those people. Just before the election, Rachel Held Evans, who is a former evangelical, and now she's kind of what you call a progressive Christian, she circulated an article that got several hundred thousand views where she wrote just basically saying, okay, I don't believe in abortion, but as a pragmatist, I see the fact that it's under those, uh, those pro-choice president uh, administrations that the abortion rate goes down. And it's in the states where they use comprehensive education and where they actually are pro-choice, uh, where they've got stronger pro-choice advocacy and laws, those are the states that have lower uh, rates of abortion because they've gotten good access to good birth control on the front end and good sex education. There are Christians who know this, and we need to find them and build alliances with them. And, and this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with uh, before I, I hit DeVos one more time. Um, I think that you need to be listening for those voices that know how to capture in, in words that even religious people can understand why it matters to them. Because if they, if they can't allow you to be free to be who you are, then how do they know they're not going to be the ones that are next to not be free with the way they are? And, and we need to find those voices that highlight that and, and put them out front and show them this is in your best interest too because that's what people do, right? They, they do things that are in their own best interests. Some of us are really empathetic and we tend to do things for other people, but everybody's not that way. Some people need to just see that, that this is a benefit to them as well. Okay, and that's why having a Baptist minister say that was so helpful. Um, but now I'm, I'm going to go on and talk about DeVos. I asked the director of the ACLU in Michigan to tell me just a breakdown on what it is the DeVos's had been up to. All right, so uh, there were essentially three education-related pushes that they've been a part of over the last decade or so. The kids first, yes. Yeah, I hate these things, by the way, because as a public school teacher, I know the pros and cons of what goes into uh, taking money away from one system to help another system. Uh, let me give you a quick example. Uh, the last inner city school that I was working for had a meeting one day to tell us that they were changing the attendance rules 
for our students. Now, you know, when you're a senior, you often get done with like one period left, so you can go on and get, you know, leave. Uh, but they changed the rule a couple of years ago that said that students had to be in class for like 80% of the day or something like that, or they would not be counted as present for that day. And the problem is the attendance records for the school determine what the budget for that school will be the next year, which is why students uh, get pushed so hard by their teachers to be at school, even if you know, they're not even struggling and if they're getting ready to graduate, they still have to be there. But by setting it at the percentage they set it at, the students that went home after their classes were done were counted as absent for that day by state law. This was not an accident. This was written by legislators that knew that they could reduce the funding for these public schools if they would raise the percentage of how much of the day you had to be there to be counted as present because they knew that attendance was tied to the funding. So for the next year, this, the education budget was cut tremendously because, tremendously, I've been listening to politics way too much, now I'm saying tremendously. That's, anyway, they were able to cut back on state budgets legally because they used the attendance records based on those changed percentages. This is sinister to me because I know what they're doing. They, they have this other thing they want to use the money for. And, and as a person raised conservative, I get the idea. I understand why charter schools are appealing to people. I really do. I was, I was raised with a little bit of a silver spoon myself. I was all private school from start to finish. And uh, so I, I know what it's like to have people around you that are just like you. And I know that people like that. I know that it's, that's rewarding, it's gratifying. And parents love it, and they'll spend extra money if they have it for, in order for it to happen. But to take tax money to do it, that's kind of low because there are students who don't have any money. They, their parents can't send them to these sorts of schools. And you can frame it as a school choice or that it's, it's for the kids. But it's not for the kids. It's for the parents to be able to you know, indoctrinate their children however they want to. So in Michigan, uh, in this, this previous election cycle, the Detroit Free Press reported that the DeVosses were showering state legislative candidates with near unprecedented amounts of money, $1.45 million in June and July alone, that's just two months, over a seven-week period, an average of $25,000 a day going into the legislative candidates for their campaigns with the intent to stop legislative efforts to invoke more oversight of charter schools. What's wrong with oversight of charter schools? I mean, it's one thing to to want to have them funded, but why remove the, fun, why remove the oversight, right? Uh, Betsy and Dick DeVos served as the primary fundraisers and engine for a Michigan ballot initiative a few years ago in 2000 called Kids First, Yes, that would have amended the state constitution to allow public financing of private, secular, and religious schools. It failed, okay? 68% of the Michigan voters rejected that, but they didn't stop, you know? They kept going. They started something called the Great Lakes Education Project. Following the defeat of the voucher effort in 2000, DeVos started the Great Lakes Education Project, a 501c4 advocacy organization, of which she and her husband have both served as chairs and board of advisors. Greg Brock, who was the campaign manager of the failed attempt from before, became the chair of this and failed uh, to, to get a voucher initiative pushed through uh, at that time. 2002, Dick DeVos gave a speech on school choice at the Heritage Foundation. Y'all heard of that. All right, describing a system of rewards and consequences. Notice that verbiage, not punishments, consequences. Um, to pressure state politicians to support vouchers and describe Betsy's role in putting the idea into practice in Michigan. She was one of the key people, one of the key players in getting that in place. In the most recent election, the GLEP, Great Lakes Education Program, announced that 49 of 53 candidates endorsed by the group were successful in the general election. That's an amazing success rate for the Michigan House of Representatives. The candidates included 25 re-elected, but 24 new legislators, all backed by GLEP. So you see what the DeVos's pull in the state is, and, and what they're pushing the money into specifically is the school voucher programs. All right? Another one they started was called All Children Matter. <laughs> Some matter more than others. Some, a, a related organization found in 2003, All Children Matter self-described as a bipartisan, nonprofit advocacy organization supporting quality choices in public education for all Michigan students, with a stated mission to improve academic achievement, increase accountability, and empower parental choice, that's always the key term, in our public schools. Of course, there's an irony there because there's actually a lot of parents that don't have that choice. And this is only choice for the ones who already have that privilege because of financial reasons. And they're the ones who, even when they're not financially sound, they, they're connected to the right communities that can get them hooked up with these things because of their communities and their churches. Media reports identify that the organization spent $7.6 million just in its first year impacting elections, not just in Michigan, but in 10 targeted states with a win-loss record of 121 to 60. The organization was fined 5.2 million in Ohio, not even their own state, 
for breaking campaign finance laws and lost an appeal in early 2010. The organization was also fined in Wisconsin, another state, for failing to register their PAC. You understand this is a family that has been working to push charter schools nationally and they put a lot of money into it. And this is, this is the kind of thing we have to fight with FIRE. And again, I know I'm assuming that people here are against vouchers and, uh, and, and charter schools. But the fact of the matter is that, that the overwhelming majority of these are religious institutions. And they're using this as a way around how to teach their children creationism, or how to teach them that being gay is bad. You know, uh, and they're teaching that pluralism is not the original American vision. They'll go back to Patrick Henry and say, see, the founders really wanted a Christian nation. Because that story's there if you look for it. It is there. It's just, it's not the whole story. And they weren't the ones that won out originally. All right, last part. Uh, the American Federation for Children. How many organizations does this family have? In 2010, DeVos launched the American Federation for Children, uh, promoting school choice, school vouchers, and scholarship tax credit programs. The AFC has been instrumental in encouraging state legislators to pass, pass voucher bills and legislation related to school choice. The organization has regional offices across the country. This is the kind of thing that has made them so successful. They understand that you can't just do something in your own area. You have to build national organizations that have, you know, offices everywhere. That's who's in charge of our education department, by the way. Um, the FC's biggest successes have been in Georgia, where it helped reinstate a commission that authorized charter schools. Virginia, where it helped pass legislation calling for scholarship tax credits. Wisconsin, where it helped create a voucher program for children with special needs and Florida, with thanks to its tax credit scholarship program, has over 50,000 students attending their school of choice. They're also working in Louisiana and Indiana. I'm just trying to get across to you the, the scope of what one family with enough money uh, has been able to do, because they have a vision. And the DeVosses are reformed Calvinists. They're, they're, they're of the branch of Christianity that believes that the Christian faith is supposed to transform the culture. That's a term they use a lot. They, they don't have the two cities mentality that Baptists do, where you've got the, the kingdom of God over here, and then you've got the kingdom of the world over here, and they're not the same thing. The Calvinist vision for America, and for any country, is that God's kingdom is supposed to take over the kingdom of the world, which means that the DeVosses and people like them want to see Christians take over all the important positions of government so that they can influence the government into you know, the kingdom of God. And these are the folks that are going to be running things. By the way, this is unrelated. What? Like dominionism. Like it's dominionism. That is what it is. This is called dominionism. Um, and I, I read just about an hour ago that uh, we think that Trump's pick for Secretary of State is, what's his name, Rex Tillerson or Tilson? Uh, he's supposed to announce it later in the week, but NBC reports that he's probably going to pick this guy that's an oil man from Exxon um, who has very close ties to Vladimir Putin. Uh, because he worked a lot of deals with them for their, you know, uh, oil contracts and things. And, uh, and he may be the next Secretary of State. I was saying on Facebook just the other day that my thought is that whoever's going to pick for Secretary of State is going to be whoever's the most pro-Putin. And, and it looks like probably that's what's happening. So I don't know any, I don't know any nonpartisan way to talk about these things. Uh, there comes a point in time where you have to look at things like Russian entanglement in American affairs and you have to start saying this isn't a Democrat or Republican thing this is like this is a national security thing and then and people bullying on the internet like having a presidential elect a president elect bullying women on Twitter and, and having a, a, a union leader get doxxed and then uh, harassed and having his children threatened this is no longer a partisan issue this is now a decency issue and and here's my final point we're not the only ones that feel that way. Religious people feel that way too. And if we spend all of our time talking about how we're different from them, as many atheists do, wanting to, to, to draw that line around the belief in God as the main thing we want to talk about, I think that's a self-defeating way of approaching this situation that we're in. We are outnumbered. They have been working to get into positions like this for decades. And if we're going to be successful in pushing some of this back, we're going to have to find our natural allies among the religious people who also don't believe that you're supposed to blend these two things together, church and state, because there's a lot of people who don't believe that from their side. All right, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you.